If you've never felt like you fit in, if you felt like you had to fight just to be yourself, today's show, my friend, today's show is for you. Welcome to the future where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is a no, and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. AD on the radio. So, you know, I was asked a question the other day, a question that I get a lot from another person in radio. Who'd heard about this show and went, well, what is it? What do you talk about? What is it? What, are you right wing? Are you left wing? What, what's your show? And here's the thing. If you listen to this show on one of the talk radio stations it's on, you might not even know me as this guy, but the vast majority of my work day is taken up by rock and alternative type radio. I'm on like 25 or so stations around the country doing that kind of thing. And you know, I love that. I love sharing music with people. I love sharing music and some laughs and trying to help people deal with their commute home a little bit better than maybe they would. Maybe give somebody a reason to smile. Maybe play them a song they love. Maybe tell them something about that song that they love that they didn't know. Music, laughs, conversation, trying to make a sucky commute slightly less sucky. This is what takes up the vast majority of my day. And I love that so much. And you might not be aware of that if you listen to this show on a talk station. But here's the deal. To those people that know me as that guy, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, it's very difficult for them to imagine me, especially radio professionals, it's very difficult for them to imagine me doing anything else. You, you have a talk show. What do you What do you talk about? How could that How could this be? Let me pontificate and scratch my head over this. And look to you and I, maybe slightly more evolved in our thinking. It's perfectly normal that somebody that likes to talk about music can also talk about news, politics, the way they feel. <laughs> I mean, you know, that makes sense, right? You'd be amazed how many people have a hard time wrapping their minuscule brains around such an easy-to-get concept, but they do. And because I've been asked this question so many times, what do you talk about? What, what is it? Is it, is it are, you, are you right-wing? Are you left-wing? What are you what, dealing you, you, uh, Because I've been asked those stupid questions over and over and over again, and a lot recently, I figured... I should probably have an answer. So I started to think about what this show is. I started to think about what you and I have in common, why we come together every day, why more and more of us come together every single day listening to this show. It went from being this thing that only existed online to this thing that only existed on one radio station in the middle of the night to this thing that now exists on a bunch of radio stations around the country. And that's really, really gratifying. But to the people that listen to it, it seems like an obvious thing. Well, we hang out. We talk about stuff. We talk about the events of the day. We talk about what's going on in the world of politics. We talk about defining ourselves and our personal liberties. We talk about politicians and how we don't necessarily trust them because we know they're not necessarily the public servants they purport to be. And we have some laughs. It's good times. But I figured I should kind of try and for the sake of the people that don't get it, that work in radio, that want to understand it. I mean, yeah, I, I'm sounding snarky because it's an old conversation. It's a, it's a conversation I've had with people over and over again, and I get bored of having it. But you know what? Maybe, maybe <clears throat> if I come up with a better way of explaining it, I won't have to have it as much. So I started thinking. I started thinking about what it was that bonds you and I together, why the show has grown and continues to grow. Maybe not as quickly, maybe not as big as a lot of the sort of more extreme viewpoints that are represented in media. Maybe not as quickly as people that make being a lightning rod for controversy their bread and butter, but we grow. And you know what? We might not have 
as broad a group of people here with this show as many other talk radio shows do. But you know what? We go deeper, you and I. We go deeper and we're more connected. And I'll take that any day. But I started thinking about what we are. And it made me think of my childhood. Now, I don't know how you grew up. I don't know what type of kids you went to school with. I don't know how much peer pressure there was. I don't know how much pressure there was to fit in there was around when you were a kid. But for me, as sort of a bit of a fish of water, a fish out of water child coming from my Native America and moving to England when I was eight years old, where things were very, very different, I experienced some stuff that I think has shaped me, and if you're listening to this show, has shaped you as well. And it has to do with what we are and why we're all here together today. Real Radio. 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 104.1. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio, on Twitter at ADSXE. So as you and I were talking about earlier, I got asked that age-old question. You, you do talk radio? What's that all about? What are you talking about? And it made me kind of try and think about why it is you and I gather together here every single day. The show continues to grow and more and more people seem to gravitate to it and Well, here's the thing. When asked about the identity of the show, is it right? Is it left? No, it's not. It sort of takes things at face value. And we've talked a lot about these ideas, this idea that, look, right, left, up, down, side to side, libertarian, whatever the hell it is you choose to identify as. If you're like me, you choose to identify as nothing because you believe it's an intrinsically limiting thing. That's beside the point. But no matter what your beliefs are, you, me, all of us, The vast majority of us want the same thing. What do we want in America? Well, we want a roof over our head. That's for starters. We would like to have work. And we would like for that work to be meaningful. If we have kids, we would like for them to have a shot, a real shot at an education, a real shot at a future. And if we bear in mind that we all want these things, if we all want these things, We just have different ideas of the best way to get there, the quickest way to get there. We can maybe talk a little bit to one another about what we believe, share ideas with people that think differently from us, who we stand the best chance of learning from, and maybe maybe we can all sort of get there quicker. It's a show about a conversation. It's a show about people coming together. It's a show about the individual and being okay to be the individual. See, that's a problem with America. I mean, (laughs) how long do you got? There's a lot of problems with America. But that, I suppose, to me, is one of the biggest problems with America. And it's becoming an even bigger problem every single day with how divided we are as a nation. But America was founded on the idea of individual liberty. Weirdly enough, though, the individual not exactly celebrated in the good old U.S. of A., and it's like my conversation with these radio folks about this show. What is it? We need to be able to put it into a box to understand it. People like to be able to put you into a box. People like to be able to put you into a box that makes you easy to understand. A simple person requires a simple narrative. And America has gotten way too into the simple narrative of joiners. That individualism that made us who we are is getting washed out. And that's a real shame because that's what keeps us, keeps us interesting. Not a liberal. Not a Republican. Not a libertarian. I'm me. It has nothing to do with how I voted. There's things that I believe. There's things I believe about politics. But you can't put them in a box. And that makes people uneasy. And it reminded me of when I was a kid. Now, I don't know how much peer pressure there was for you when you were a child or a teenager. I don't know how much pressure there was for you to fit in. But when I first moved from America to England, when I was a kid, I found a lot of things to be very, very different. 
First and foremost, the school was tough. They were way ahead of where the hell I was when I was seven, eight years old. So I didn't fit in scholastically. I was running to catch up for the first year that I was there. Plus, you know, the dyslexia and the ADD, I was sat at the back of the class and told that not that much was ever really expected of me. If I could just try and finish my homework, that would be great. So I I definitely didn't feel like I fit in with all the other people that had been learning the things that I hadn't been learning for the last six months. Getting caught up was no joke, and it made me feel like an outcast, like an outsider. And then I didn't really dress like all the kids in England did. And I don't suppose people are especially fashion conscious at age seven or eight, but I knew I wasn't dressing like these kids and they knew I wasn't dressing like them. And then as I got a little older, those differences kind of got magnified. I was really into rap music. A lot of the kids that I went to school with were rockers and rap music was not really a thing. I had sort of Longer hair. Nothing crazy, but just longer than the rest of the kids at school. And I was into comic books. I love comic books and rap music. I had long hair. I love jazz music as well. I like groups like Steely Dan. I liked records by Miles Davis and John Coltrane and the Beastie Boys. And that wasn't what, uh, that wasn't what a lot of the kids that were all about Pearl Jam really could get into. And so I remember, and maybe you had a moment like this as well. I remember feeling like I just don't fit. I'm not that crazy. I'm not into anything that's all that out there or weird, but I just don't fit in with the rest of these kids. My father used to say that going to pick me up from school was fun because he got to see what it was like when a bunch of kids dressed alike and followed each other around. And that's sort of what was going on. Kids looked alike. They listened to the same music. They wore the same concert t-shirts. They listened to the same stuff. And, well, I wasn't one of them. It was really clear to me that I wasn't one of them. And we got along, and we were chill with each other. But, like I said, it was very clear that just because of the stuff I liked... And the way I went through the world, the music I listened to, the books I like to read, that I didn't fit in. And I wished I did, but I knew I couldn't force it. And all of a sudden, when I discovered the work of one man, I felt like that didn't matter. And I suppose this is why we're all here together today. Whose work was it? We'll get into it next. For more stimulation and less irritation, 9 out of 10 doctors choose KPRC AM 950. Houston's more stimulating talk radio. Don't get the blues, get all the news. We mean all of you. Guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. Bring this on, bring this on. Come on, come on. So I was asked a little while ago about this show. I was asked a little while ago about who this show is for. I mean, really, what happened was some radio guy was like, what's it all about? What are you talking about? Are you, you, you right wing? You left? What, what, are you, what are you doing? Is it a liberal show? Are you Colbert? Are you Rush Limbaugh? What box can I put you in? And that's sort of been the struggle, I think, throughout life. And if you've listened to this show for any length of time, I'm going to guess you've had that struggle as well. Like I said, when I was a kid, I went to England and fit in, but didn't fit in. Like, kids were dressing differently. I was academically behind a lot of the other children there. I had ADD, I had dyslexia, and also, you know, my second and third grade classes in England were probably about a year ahead to six months ahead of what the hell it is I'd been learning in the public school system in New York at the time. Maybe it was just different curriculums and New York would have caught up eventually, but I was woefully behind and I was let, uh, my teachers let me know that I was woefully behind from the get-go. So I didn't fit in. And then as we got older 
I didn't like all the same music that everybody else liked. I mean, some of it, yeah. But I wasn't wearing those same concert t-shirts that everybody else was wearing. I really liked the music of Miles Davis and John Coltrane, and Beastie Boys and Run DMC and Tribe Called Quest. And man, a lot of the kids at my school just kind of didn't relate. And so I remember thinking, I, I just, I, I don't fit in. I mean, it doesn't bother me that much, but it's pretty clear to me that I don't. And then there was the work of one man. There was the work of one man who, kind of for a second, made me realize, well, that's okay. That's okay to not fit in. So much of it was about how you looked. I mean, people have tribes, I suppose, that they become a part of when they're in high school. And you can kind of eyeball someone and figure out what tribe they're in. And I don't think that was the case with me. My father, like I said, used to joke when he picked me up from school. He's like, yeah, you know what sixth graders seem to do? They uh, dress alike and follow each other around. I mean, there was a bit of a uniform, you know, hoodie, jean jacket, jeans, sneakers. Sort of the same thing that I actually sort of wear today, weather permitting. But I still, I still wasn't part of the clique. And people knew that, and they respected that, and... You know, I wasn't invited to all the parties. I wasn't invited to do all the sorts of things that lots of other kids were doing. And I was sort of okay with that because it's not what I wanted to do. You know, oh man, do you remember encountering, encountering tribalism for the first time when you were going through that arduous prospect of which table you're going to sit at in the lunchroom? And I found myself in a really difficult position a lot of the time where like I was cool with everybody. I got along with everybody without necessarily being down with any one click. But, you know, there's the nerdy kids over there saying, like, come and sit with us. Let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons and comic books. And there's, like, the cooler kids going, come over here. Let's talk about baseball and, you know, who we're going to try and take to the prom. And I was like, ah, I don't want to make this choice between people. I don't want to wind up hurting some person's feelings. So I just wound up going to the art room or the music room and working. (laughs) I would teach drum lessons during my lunch period, partially because I wanted the money, partially because I didn't want to have to sort of deal with the glaring necessity that everybody else seemed to have to fit in. And if you're like me, if you're listening to the show, if you've listened to the show for any length of time, there's a very good, very good chance that you felt something similar. You felt like you didn't fit in. You felt like you didn't have to fit in. You felt like it was stupid that anybody would expect you to fit in. But it was a work of one man that made me go, oh, I get it. I get it. This is, this is okay. This is cool. This is going to be all right. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Henry Rollins, but I found him at just the right time when I was a kid. I knew Black Flag. Black Flag were a big deal to me. Their music was a big deal to me. But then my friend told me that he also did these shows where he was just talking. Henry Rollins did these shows where he was just talking. All he did was talk. I was like, what? Is it stand-up comedy? He's like, no, it's just talking. It's that, And you know, now it's known as spoken word. But just that in and of itself, that in and of itself made me realize, oh, you can do something different and have it work out. Henry Rollins, I guess, sort of started something with spoken word. He got up and he talked and people enjoyed it. And so for the longest time, people struggled to kind of try and figure out what it was he was doing. It it seems like comedy, but it's not always funny and he's not trying to make you laugh. And he's just sort of, hmm, what is this? What exactly is this? And people like eventually attach the name to it, spoken word. I don't think Henry Rollins ever said, I'm a spoken word artist. Now you get people coming out going, I'm a spoken word artist. But I realized one very important thing. Nobody could sort of wrap their head around this guy just going out and talking, but he was doing it and people were showing up. I was like, oh, so it's okay to like be different. Also, there was the way Black Flag and the Rollins band looked. Punk rock, in many ways, was sort of supposed to be about rugged individualism. However, punk rock also historically has come with a certain amount of conformity. You're not punk enough. You're the wrong kind of punk. Your Doc Martens don't have the right number of holes in them. Your safety pins through the wrong orifice. I don't know. 
But punk rock, which was supposed to be this flag-waving moment of individualism, became a lot more about conformity in terms of the way you look. And that's one thing I noticed about Black Flag. I was like, these guys are supposed to be punk, but they don't have, you know, funny colored mohawks and stuff. They're just sort of like, they they just look like guys, you know? They just look like people. And it's more about the music that they're making than any attitude or pose or pair of pants or sneakers or hair dye color. And I dug that. I was into that. But then when I found out Henry Rollins did this thing where he just talked, that was it. He created something new that people came to know and identify years later as spoken word, but he created something new and he did it because he just freaking felt like doing it. And then when I actually listened to this stuff, here's this guy talking about I'll never forget, I think it was on the Box Life album, where he was talking about the music he'd been listening to on the plane. And he said, I've been listening to a mixture of John Coltrane and the Beastie Boys. I was like, I listen to John Coltrane and the Beastie Boys, and no one has ever, ever said me too with that stuff. So I was like, this is sort of my guy. But what I realized was, this was a dude that created his own world. Everything that he liked, he just went after it and he did it. It didn't matter if it was easy to categorize. It didn't matter if it was easy to define. The music of Black Flag, people tell you it was punk, but not punk enough, or it was a certain type of punk, or it was hardcore. It was what it, to them, it was, just, it was just music. And it had nothing to do with a haircut. It had nothing to do with fitting in. It had to do with taking what was in your heart and screaming it out for the world to hear at the top of your lungs if you're Rollins. So that was a big deal to me. And as I look around today, as I look around today at this demand for conformity, this demand to fit in, this demand for people to identify And if you don't identify, it's weird. People are almost afraid of you because they don't know what box to put you in. If you are a Democrat that goes, no, actually, what Trump did with Lil' Kim, I'm cool with that. That that seems like it's moving us forward. There's a very good chance you're going to get called a traitor. Or you're, you're going to scare people. Because they don't, they don't understand someone who can dislike Trump but think he did something that's okay. And if you're a righty, if you're a Donald Trump supporter, but you go, oh man, what the hell was Melania doing with that, that, that jacket? That was mind-numbingly stupid. <laughs> what the hell, man? Oh yeah, you, you rhino, you Republican in name only. You're not on our side, and we know this because you don't agree with absolutely everything that everybody does. We're scared of you, therefore we're going to yell at you and tell you that you're a traitor to your country. People are so scared of that which they don't understand. People are so scared of things that aren't easy to put into a box. People are so scared to let other people just be themselves. It's very strange. And I don't know, I'm not old enough to know if it was that way in the past. You know, you hear about what life was like during the 60s and 70s where everybody was just being themselves and letting their freak flag fly. And I, I, don't, I don't know if that was the case. I'm not sure. I don't, I, don't know. I don't know if there was that genuine freedom of thought back then. If there was, we've devolved. And so, I suppose... And this is a very roundabout way of saying it. But I suppose that freedom that a guy like Rollins gave me to be myself, that freedom that a guy like him gave me to go, like, you know what? It doesn't freaking matter what kind of music I like or don't like. It doesn't matter what sneakers or haircut I've got going on. It doesn't matter whether it's easy for other people to put me into a box and make me fit in and try and understand you know, who the hell I am. doesn't matter if I don't have my 15 second elevator speech ready to go, you know, so I can sell myself whenever it's necessary to sell myself. All that, it's crap. And it doesn't matter. This show, I guess, is for people 
who feel as though they just want to be themselves. This show is for people who are above the small-minded world of party and identity politics. This show is a place for people who have one thing in common and one thing in common only. And that is, other places in their life, they haven't felt comfortable being themselves. The rest of it, the more difference between us, the better. We're going to have better conversations. We're going to learn more things from each other. We're going to have a more productive time. Everything will be better if we gather as many people around this show and as many people around this show's Twitter and email and all of the above at ADSXE is where you can find me on Twitter and Instagram or you can email me AD at iHeartRadio.com. Everything will be better if we get more people that are different from ourselves together. The only thing that I think we all have in common, the thing that I guess is the defining moment for this show, the thing that when I'm asked by other people, what's it with your show? What is it? Is it, is it right wing? Is it liberal? Are you a young Rush Limbaugh? Or are you a young John Stewart? W- what are you? I think the only thing that I'll tell them is that this is a show for people who just want to be themselves. This is a show for people who buck conformity. This is a show for people who think independently. This is a show for people that just want to be themselves. If you've ever had to fight just to be yourself, then this, my friend, is a show for you. This is a show, as the great Henry Rollins put it, with his band Black Flag, is for people who want to rise above. Don't you just love summertime? There's something about it. There's something about the warmer nights. There's something about opening up all the windows in the house, looking for that elusive breeze. There's something about the way the pavement smells after the sun's been on it all day long. That takes you back to when summer really meant something. Now, now you're dealing with the 4th of July being on a Wednesday going, ah, oh, this sucks. Last year, it was on a Tuesday, so everybody knew they were taking a long weekend. Next year, it'll be on a Thursday, and everybody will take the long weekend on the other side of the 4th of July. But now, it's in the middle of the week. It's sort of this non-event where everyone's like, oh, I can't take that many days off. And the, 
It just doesn't feel like you're really enjoying summer with this 4th of July for some reason. But we're all genetically hardwired and predisposed to remember those times where we felt a sense of infinite possibility and infinite freedom as a child. You get out on that last day of school and you have that everlasting summer. (laughs) Uh, There's that amazing line in that amazing Steely Dan song, Reeling in the Years. Your everlasting summer, you can see it fading fast, so you grab a piece of something that you think is going to last. And it does. It goes so quickly. But you have this sense that it's going to go on and on and on. And then there's this whole question. How are you going to fill your days as an adult? Have you had this concern since you hit adulthood? Have you ever worried about how you're going to fill your days? If you're like the vast majority of us, you're working 8 million jobs just to make ends meet. You're trying to do anything that you can to get any personal time for yourself. And, well... You don't really have that concern of how am I going to fill my day up? But when you were a kid, you didn't know what you were going to do with yourself all summer long. And you were so excited to have that freedom. And then inevitably the boredom seeps in. And that's when your parents start to go, oh man, how long till school starts again? Because it's interesting. I think we were talking about this on the show last week, but apparently parents love having their kids home for the summer for 13 days. And after 13 days, after you hit the 13 day mark, You start to feel worried. You start to feel pressured. You start to feel as though you're not helping your kid do enough with their summer. So (laughs) you're trying to find all these things to fill it. You don't have that problem as an adult. You never are looking for things to fill your days. The days are just packed with responsibilities and obligations. And as an adult, you long for the long days of summer where you had nothing to do. But eventually, parents say, get out of the house. (laughs) Go do something. Maybe maybe get a job. Maybe get a summer job. Maybe maybe mow lawns. Mowing lawns, as idyllic of a pastime as it would seem to be for a young person in America trying to make the most of their summer vacation, uh, mowing lawns can apparently go horribly wrong. Did you see this? A woman in Cleveland <clears throat> hired a 12-year-old kid to mow her lawn, but <laughs> her neighbors called the cops because he'd mowed the wrong lawn. The y'all people came, you know, and was cut my grass, you know, to stay off the street. So you see the police car right there. My neighbors that stay in that house right there. So I guess I have like a line where part of it is not my yard. They called the police to tell the police that the kids was cutting their grass. Who does that? Who does that? They called the police for everything. They called the police because my kids were throwing snowballs. They called the police because my child was crying because he was getting a whipping. Who does that? Who calls the police for everything? They should be glad these kids not out here breaking their car windows out. They should be glad the kids not out here stealing their cars. You called the police because the kids is out here cutting the grass and they cut the grass that wasn't a part of our grass? I don't know what part is my grass and what part is your grass. Yeah. Woman in Cleveland named Lucille Holt hired that 12-year-old kid to mow her lawn. Neighbors called the cops because he accidentally mowed part of their lawn. So they got a little bit of a free lawn mowing, decided they'd call the cops. Anyway, she made that video. It went viral. And now the kid now the kid has a lot more business. So good for him. Another thing about summertime. Oh, man. Do you remember this? The ice cream truck chasing it down on a hot day uh, is the absolute greatest. My mom was super strict with that. No, no, you can't go to the ice cream truck. No, you're not allowed to have ice cream. No, it's got artificial colors, artificial flavors, got sugar in it. No, you can't have that. And I didn't care. I chased down the ice cream truck anyway. I had my allowance. I figured it was mine. I'd saved it. I'd earned it. I'd done the chores for it. It was mine and I was going to get ice cream. And I knew that when I came back to my mom with the ice cream cone in hand and offered to share it with her, she would think completely differently of me. I got in so much trouble. But you know what? The ice cream cone, despite the fact that I disobeyed her, went into the fridge and I was allowed to have it later. So that all worked out. Remember when the ice cream man used to come to town when you was little? And no matter what you was doing, you would stop and lose your mind. (laughs) There's something about the ice cream truck that made kids lose it. And they can hear that from 10 blocks away. They don't hear their mother calling them, but they hear that ice cream truck. And no matter what was going on, the ice cream man came and stopped. You hear, ice cream! Ice 
cream, man. Thank you. And you get your ice cream. I get my ice cream. And I didn't eat it. I sang for a little while, you know. You know how kids are. I have you I have some ice cream. I have some ice cream. You know, there'd be one kid on the side, didn't get no ice cream, and kids don't care. They go, You don't have no ice cream. You didn't get none. You didn't get none. Cause you are on the welfare. You can't afford it. Other kids join in. You can't afford it. You can't afford it. And his father is an alcoholic. He wants some ice cream. He wants to eat some of my ice cream, but wanna lick? Psych. You want some ice cream. He wants some ice cream. Uh, the lazy, crazy, hazy days of summer. How many days are you taking off for this 4th of July? Are you taking any days off? Are you just taking the 4th of July that you actually get? Are you like me? Are you going to have to work through the 4th of July? This has been a hot topic of conversation around pretty much every office place in America, and we'll discuss it next. How many days are you taking off for the 4th of July? We'll get into it directly ahead. Thank you so much for hanging out. Tweet me your answer at ADSXE. the stimulation to the professionals everyone is so smart kbrc more stimulating talk radio there's something happening here and you should know what it is (laughs) the dumbing up of america now more ad on the radio So if you are a kid enjoying summer vacation, you don't really have your mind on anything other than summer vacation. That's it. Like we said, Steely Dan's immortal line, your everlasting summer. You can see it's fading fast, so you grab a piece of something that you think is going to last. When you're a kid, that's all that matters. You know you got school. You know you probably have that dreaded summer reading project that's due. Oh, did you have summer reading? I had summer reading. It was the worst because I read nonstop all summer long. Now, one of the books that I chose to read was required reading, though, on the summer lead, summer reading thing. And my mom would tear her hair out over it. Like, you read. You've probably read a hundred books this summer. And you can't bring yourself to read two on the required reading list. No, couldn't do it. Couldn't, couldn't bring myself to do it. This is my time. The idea that I would have to do homework was an indignity to me when I was in school. Like the idea that during the school year, I'd have to go home. All right, finally out of that miserable place, finally out of school. Now I'm home. What do I have to do? More schoolwork? Ugh, the humanity. I don't feel like this is necessary. I feel like this is overkill. I feel like they're just doing it to keep us busy so our mind doesn't turn to other things. My mind needs to turn to other things, Mom. And so I wouldn't read the required summer reading. <laughs> I would read like 50 to 100 books probably over the summer. And then I would copy my book report from the cliff notes of the book that I was supposed to have read, but never wound up doing as a point of principle, <clears throat> I think it became afterwards. So, yeah, <laughs> if you're a kid, all that's on your mind over the summertime is being a kid. But if you're in that weird transitional phase, if you're in that weird transitional phase between your last couple of years of high school and college, then you start to wonder. You start to wonder what the future holds. You start to wonder about things like what you're going to be, what you're going to do with yourself, what you're going to be like when you're a grown up. Where will you live? How many kids will you have? Will you have kids? Will you meet someone? Will you settle down? Will you get married? Will you travel the world? Will you put on a backpack and make your way with no plan and no map and just go? You have all these questions. But what everybody's really asking you is, what are you going to study when you get to college? And uh, according to John Mulaney, an English degree should not be it. An English major. (laughs) I paid $120,000. How dare you clap? How dare you clap for the worst financial decision I ever made in my life? I paid $120,000 for someone to tell me to go read Jane Austen, and then I didn't. (laughs) That's the worst use of 120 grand I can possibly fathom. 
other than if you like bought a duffel bag of fake cocaine. <laughs> no, I take it back. That's a better use of the money. Because I know you'd be disappointed when you open up the duffel bag and you realize it's not real cocaine. It's like powdered baby aspirin or whatever they do. But at least you have baby aspirin. <laughs> and maybe you have a baby. And one day your baby goes, oh, my head. And you go, hey, I got something for you. Come here, little guy. And you, you, know, you dump it out on a mirror. You make it nice for the baby. You make it nice. You cut it up into lines. And your baby takes his sippy cup straw. And he holds it in his little ravioli-sized baby fist. And he leans over. And he snorts up the baby aspirin. And he gets rid of his baby headache. Plus, you get a duffel bag. That is way better than walking across a stage at graduation, hung over in a gown, to accept a certificate for reading books that I didn't read. <laughs> Strolling across a stage, the sun in my eyes, my family watching as I sweat vodka and ecstasy, to receive a four-year degree in a language that I already spoke. Uh, you and I will talk about exactly how much time you as an adult are taking off this week for the 4th of July weekend. What is it? Is it today and tomorrow and the 4th of July and the day after that? you just taking the whole week? you just taking the 4th of July, one day and one day only. Or you like me, you're just working through the whole thing. We'll get into this and what the average American is doing because we tackle big and important issues about other people's vacations around here a little later on. Right now, though, let's take a look at the events of today and see what's going on in the news. Ed Sheeran, that little hobbity dude, the red-haired English guy, the acoustic guitar kid, he's being sued for, get this, $100 million for copying Marvin Gaye's hit, Let's Get It On. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this kid has been popped. I say kid. He's probably like 30 now, but like... This guy's been popped a couple different times for lifting other people's songwriting ideas. Whether it's been coincidental or not, I don't think he's ever really talked about. But, yeah, he's been uh, he's been nabbed for this more than once. But to the tune of $100 million, that's, a, that's an awful lot. Yeah, Ed Sheeran being sued for $100 million for copying Marvin Gaye's hit, Let's Get It On. And I believe a separate $100 million lawsuit from J.R.R. Tolkien for copying the look of a hobbit. Happy birthday to Gary Busey, who turned 74 the other day. Mm-hmm. Yep. Although I think that's only 13 on his home planet of Glaxon. <laughs> Props from Black Panther are going to be displayed at the Smithsonian. Did you see this? Yep. Black Panther, a historically significant movie for any number of reasons. And because of that, props from it are going to be displayed at the Smithsonian. Meanwhile, the shield from Captain America will continue to be displayed on your IT Guys t-shirt. He and other people, like yours truly, that did not date in high school, have been wearing that one proudly for years. Man, I was bummed out. I was bummed out when the Avengers and Spider-Man and all this sort of stuff became a massive movie thing. I mean, I like the movies. They're really good. I got into them. Finally, technology sort of caught up with our dreams in terms of what superhero movies and television shows should look like. So that's been cool. But here's the thing. I love Spider-Man. I love Captain America. These were... These were important integral parts of my youth these are comic books that i still enjoy reading and so i kind of liked it when i discovered the t-shirts now they're everywhere it's not all that difficult you used to have to hunt these things down you have to go to comic book stores you had to go to your closest forbidden planet which by the way amazing comic book store if you've never been there you used to have to go to Forbidden Planet or wherever it was to track down a Flash t-shirt or a Captain America t-shirt with a shield on it. And now, like, anyone can get them at Old Navy. There's nothing wrong with that. They're cool. They're iconic pieces of logo design. Spider-Man's mask. Captain America's helmet. Uh, Captain America's shield, rather. And those things, well, Captain America's helmet with the little wings, for that matter, as well. Those things are amazing and classic, and there's no reason why the vast majority of the population wouldn't want to wear them. But now, whenever I, like, don my Captain America shield shirt, I feel as though I'm just participating in some sort of crass mass consumerism, as opposed to that hard-won honor of having hunted down that shirt like I, I did in the past. But, nah. We don't sweat the small stuff around here. Congratulations to Brooklyn Nine-Nine star Stephanie Beatriz. 
who got married a little while ago. Brooklyn Nine-Nine star Stephanie Beatrice has gone on the record saying, marrying a man doesn't make her less bisexual. Yeah, she's bisexual, and she said that marrying a man doesn't make her less of a bisexual, which is probably a large part of why he married her. Uh, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly, not long for this world. John Kelly is reportedly expected to leave his job in the next few weeks. He was going to be this dude who was going to get it handled. He was rough. He was tough. He took no guff. He was going to run Trump's White House on his terms, and he wouldn't deal with Trump shenanigans. He was going to be by the book, and he was going to restore order to the White House. And Donald Trump was like, absolutely. And then the rumor is the rumor is people started circumventing him and going to Melania if they wanted to get to Trump. Like, I got something I want to say to Trump. John Kelly is not going to let me say that. Ugh, I just, I'll go around him. I'll go to Melania. I'll go to anybody else that has his ear. I'll go to Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I'll just, you know, do whatever I can to circumvent the chain of authority that is John Kelly. And so for that reason, after a stable start, things got initially, th- things got progressively more rocky for John Kelly at the White House. And so, yeah, it looks like he is not long for this world, whether it's his choice or Trump's choice. Who the hell is to say? But White House Chief of Staff John Kelly, that experiment is apparently over. He is expected to leave his job in the next few weeks. So get those resumes ready, Trump University graduates. <laughs> uh, Melania Trump visited the border for a second time in two weeks. Oh, Okay, now it's definitely clear that she's working on an escape plan, right? Yeah. Stormy Daniels wants to visit the border as well. Melania Trump visited. Now Stormy Daniels wants to visit the border as well to help migrant children. (laughs) Don't misbehave, kids, from what I understand. She's a spanker. Uh, Donald Trump eliminated President Obama-era policies that protect the world's oceans, which is a surprising move considering how much we've heard from our Russian friends that he enjoys water sports. Nah. According to a new survey, the most common sexual fantasy that Americans have is doing it with more than one person. A group situation. Yeah. According to a new survey, the most common fantasy Americans have is group sex, which barely edged out Americans' second most common fantasy. Affordable health care that's easy to understand. McDonald's. Did you see this? McDonald's is trying to shake up their breakfast menu by selling just the top part of muffins. We said yesterday, or last week on the show rather, that Jerry Seinfeld had a case if he wanted to sue them because of the muffin top episode of Seinfeld. Yeah, McDonald's is trying to shake up their breakfast menu by selling just the top part of the muffins. Oh, while you're at it, why not consider using the edible parts of chickens? I mean, that'd be a good start. Oh, not actually chicken, huh? No. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Spongy chicken. Et- okay, gotcha. Spongy chicken esque stuff. Oh, okay. The guy who invented the Keurig K cup coffee system says that he regrets inventing it because the little cups are terrible for the environment and the machines are way too expensive. Yes. The guy who invented K cups says he regrets inventing them. Inventing them. Hmm. In other news involving K cups, did you see uh, Kate Upton on the cover of the new Maxim? A New Jersey couple recently celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary at Burger King. Yeah, 50th wedding anniversary at Burger King. In their defense, Arby's was booked. But yeah, 50th wedding anniversary at Burger King. A New Jersey couple did this. That's disgusting. Who would want to be in a place like that to celebrate a special event? Ugh, New Jersey. I kid. New Jersey is a lovely place. So, all right, I guess the pressing question of this week is, how many days are you taking off? This has been the talk around the water cooler at office places and workplaces all over America. What are you doing for the 4th of July? Well, it's right in the middle of the week. It's kind of hard to say. How many days are you taking off? Oh, I'm taking the whole week off. Or, oh, I'm just taking the... The 4th of July is smack dab in the middle of the week. And from a new survey that I've got here in front of me, it looks like every business in this country is going to be either sort of understaffed or totally staffed with bitter people all week around here um i will uh be bitterly staffed or i'll be part of the embittered staff the cool thing about being forced to work on the fourth of july you know who's not going to be there your boss so it becomes about drinking it becomes a day all about drinking company coffee and surfing porn on company servers (laughs) that's what the fourth of july is for me and every single holiday where i know that my direct superior will not be showing up you'll be working i will not okay 
in that case, workplace, workplace productivity expectations are at an all time low and you can kind of do what the hell you want. That's the upside to watching fireworks from the inside of your office place. Survey asked people which days are taken off this week. A lot of people are taking today off. Well, uh, 7% of people are taking tomorrow off. Wednesday, the 4th of July, uh, 35% of Americans are taking that off. Then uh, Thursday and Friday, progressively less. So yeah, it looks like fewer people are taking days off this week than you might have guessed. But just enough people are taking time off so all their coworkers can resent them. There you go. Happy 4th of freaking July. I'll be back tomorrow. And on the 4th of July, we'll do it all over again. <laughs>